this week's lesson, uh, we're going to be getting into just touching a little bit on Roman law, but then uh, talking about marriage and family uh, a little bit. So it'll be interesting to see some of those aspects. And um, some of us will touch on scripture a little bit more than what we you may have thought. Um, but Roman law is what we're going to begin with. Uh, and just as a heads up, um, there's way too much to cover in Romans law that could ever be done, you know, in a class like this, and we, you'd get really bored, because law was very serious thing to the Romans. Uh, in fact, that was one of their great prides, was that they had an extremely structured and organized legal system uh, that helped them to be able to expand with the empire and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing that's interesting to me is, like, when I learned Latin uh, versus learning, like, Greek, the Latin is it's more rigid than the Greek is, and it's, it's, it's almost more organized. It's almost like it fits the language well, because the, they stick to the laws of their grammar better uh, than other languages uh, do. At least that was my perception uh, of it. So the sources that we have, uh, there's uh, the source of the laws that the Romans had, the laws and the statutes that were enacted by a vote of the assembly of the people. Uh, and so there were different times in Rome's history uh, that they had that uh, uh, assembly. Uh, they have, um, uh, what is it called? The tribunal. Uh, so that would have that. The Senate also uh, had resolutions um, that, that would bring out all, some of those things. Now, this is primarily post Caesar Augustus because uh, uh, the Senate kind of gets relegated to just lawmaking at that point because Caesar and the Caesars are the ones that are ruling. There's edicts uh, of the magistrates, so praetors and the governors. Those would actually be laws uh, within the, um, uh, for, the, for the governors, that's going to be uh, a Roman territory or a Roman, um, oh, come on, Judea was a Roman province. So uh, in the provincial areas, they, would, those, they could enact laws. Um, and then the constitutions of the emperors. So with the Constitution of the Emperors, you have the Edicta, which must, what must be done, uh, and the Decreta, um, which is judicial decisions in lawsuits, rescripta, responses to requests or, uh, or an embassy, and then mandata, instructions issued to officials. Now, do you recognize any of our English words as we read the Latin words? So the first one, we, would, we have the English word edict, uh, Decreta would be decree. Uh, rescripta is one that we would use less, uh, but mandata is a mandate. Uh, and so a lot of our English words that we have for those things come from uh, these ideas. Um, and then also you have replies of jurists when consulted. So in other words, when you have a court case and that, that the jurors on that court case make a decision, then that is, and it's similar to our legal system, that creates a legal precedent and a decision, so therefore it's a law kind of thing. So the Roman provincial governors held what was called imperium. Uh, now, when we think imperium, we probably automatically think imperial and empire and so on and so forth, but imperium is the basic Latin word for taxation. Uh, and a big part of what is behind Imperium is that you're there and you're able to tax them and gain revenue from the area. And that's what makes them often uh, a Roman province. And so they would still have much of their own local governors uh, or local governing bodies that would still function under the governor. Uh, and they would actually sometimes leave a lot of the governing to that. Uh, but the key point of being there was you were going to collect the taxes and Rome was going to get their money. That's the big part of it. Uh, so when they held imperium in an area, they almost did it with unlimited power of life and death over the provincials, uh, and they restricted were restricted only by laws against extortion and treason. And so as they would go in as a governor, they could do as they wished, uh, and so on and so forth. They, so when I talk about the local governing officials, they would have no authority over the governor, but the governor himself would not like handle every court case, handle all of the issues and, and paving the roads and stuff like that. They did do some of that, um, but it would instead be he would hold this total control. Uh, and what you really see being the biggest concern of Roman governors is peace. You did not want to start a riot 
with the Roman in an area that the Romans were in control of because that was one of the biggest strengths of the Roman Empire is the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Uh, and so that's when you see in, in Ephesus when Paul is there and a riot is starting over the Christians. Now they're like, stop, because the Romans are not going to like the fact that we're having this upheaval and they're going to step in and we're going to be in trouble. So cut it out and, and, and stop uh, the riot. And so the, uh, the imperium or the, 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 uh, that they held had a lot of their things there to guard that peace and keep the peace. Uh, only the holder of Imperium could exact the death penalty. Now, where do we see this in Scripture? Anyone, you guys remember? John eighteen thirty one. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've only been gone a month. <laughs> All right. So, who can remember or take a wild guess at John eighteen thirty one and what it's talking about? Pilate saying, Pilate saying, I, do you not know I have the right to save your life or to take it? Uh, and you also have in the other uh, uh, Gospels where the Jews are like, we don't have the right to, to do the death penalty, only you do. So you can see that that right is held only by the Roman governor uh, during this time. <coughs> the provincial governors uh, were accountable to the emperor and the senate alone. So <clears throat> this, is, this is a big part of that led to that Jewish war that we went through all the details of because what happened is the provincial governors were coming in they were becoming more and more corrupt and uh, and the people just started to fight against it but a, a big group of the, the Jews were like well we just need to write to the Roman Senate and write to the Emperor uh, the problem is is that toward the end they were writing to an Emperor that was not anti-Jewish because Nero was becoming frustrated with the Jews for not putting his image up and things like that and so they weren't having the emperor step in in other times prior to that they would write to the emperor about the governor and the governor would remove or be removed or they, they'd have you know something would be done about it uh, and so it's not that they had no recourse at all it's just the, the the people of any given province had to write to the emperor or the senate and then they would do something uh, about the governor the governor um, heard cases personally uh, wherever they happened to be. So when they were going around, if there was something that had to be heard by him, uh, then the governor would be the one that would hear that particular case and act as a judge uh, in that case. Uh, the one important thing under Roman law that's kind of unique and important to us in Scripture is the concept of Roman adoption. Uh, scripture uses, as you guys can see, the passages that I have next to um, this uh, green <coughs> title on your notes. Uh, those scriptures are the places where Paul uses the idea of adoption, uh, that we are adopted by God, adopted in Christ. Uh, and for us, in our concept of adoption, the, it doesn't quite hit all of what Paul is trying to say. Uh, if I talk about adoption here, what do we typically think of? What is the typical circumstance where adoption is occurring in our culture? Families sure. adopting children. Okay, families adopting children, but why? Like, why is the adoption typically happening? Just to prevent abortion. To prevent abortion or orphan. Yeah. Uh, and you're, usually what you're dealing with is somebody who's kind of coming in and graciously adopting somebody who has no parents and so on and so forth. In Roman law, you would adopt people who had parents. You could, and, and what it was is you would have somebody who, um, you can imagine, um, you're, you have this huge estate, and you have son or either no son, but you, or you have a son or a, or a, a, well, daughters weren't able to inherit that, but you have a son who is not a good son. He's, he's. Uh, uh, either rebellious or didn't care about you and and uh, and you have a bad relationship but you have this other person who you are getting along with and you really like and you want them to be the person that's going to inherit your estate that was kind of more the common idea of adoption you're coming and saying I want you to have my inheritance I want you to inherit what I have and uh, you to be my heir this is why you see the concepts of adoption and heir in the scriptures being paired so closely together. 
Uh, we are heirs with Christ Jesus because we're adopted at that level. For us, when somebody is adopted, it does not put them as a special place in, in the inheritance. If, if anything, they may still be at the bottom of the inheritance. Whereas the adoption in the Roman uh, way, you're brought up to full heir, if not the prime heir uh, of the, what is there to be inherited. Uh, this actually happened quite frequently uh, within Roman uh, culture. And in fact, this is how most of the emperors had the next emperor be their son. It was not son by actual, you know, child through genetics. It was, this is somebody they adopted as their son, and it was seen as equal uh, or even greater than actual sonship. So uh, when the adoption happened, it would be attested to by uh, witnesses, be a really big ceremony. And the adoption was a removal of the previous condition at any age. So that you would have people that would be adopted even in, as they are 50 years old uh, <laughs> because they they would reach a certain point and they have done something and they had a benefactor and they come in and they're like, I want you to be the one that inherits my my stuff and I trust you, but you're, you know, it's 50. And so when that adoption happens, all the debts of that person were canceled. Uh, the new life begins uh, with taking on the new family name uh, and then you come in with full rights of inheritance right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the, you have the new father. The responsibility the new father has is he now owns the adoptee's property. He controls all the adoptee's relationships, assumes responsibility of discipline, uh, and assumes responsibility for adoptee's support, uh, and assumes liability for adoptee's actions. So this week, there were times that somebody would be adopted out of a very bad circumstance. Their debts are canceled, but now they are beholding to the adopting father, and and uh, and they owe him uh, these things. They, they, now the everything that the adoptee had becomes the father's property, so on and so forth. You can see how this picture is much richer the concept of adoption that we have with Christ. Uh, than just our typical idea of bringing in an orphan and, and, and choosing them. Uh, because we are given a completely new identity. We now have the inheritance that is in Christ Jesus that we did not have before. But now, all we have is God's. Uh, all our relationships are for him to, to govern. Uh, he's the one responsible now to discipline us. And, uh, and he's the one that's responsible to support us and care for us and provide for us. Uh, and uh, he assumes the liability for our actions. Uh, and there's a sense of where he takes on that process of, I'm going to change you. I can, you know, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. There's a full taking on of, of that burden. And so it's really a beautiful picture when you full, fully understand uh, Roman adoption. Did the adoptee have a choice? Uh, yes, the adoptee would have had a choice. The adoptee would have... Uh, you know, at this point, though, typically you'd be really dumb to say no. Uh, but uh, typically, um, you know, if you would, you would have some. Sometimes there would even be a servant that would be adopted into this type of thing. Uh, the real thing is making you a legal heir uh, to all that they have, um, and uh, and so I mean, in one sense, everything that you own becomes the father's. But once the father passes, it all becomes yours again at that point. So, so socially, uh, the culture we're going to talk about, you know, what was what was immoral, and then what was family and such like at this time. Uh, it was a culture of immorality. We've talked about that a little bit before, because there what the what was moral. It's not that there, the word didn't exist then, but what was moral was not what we think of as moral. A lot of what we think of as what is moral and immoral, and if I talk of somebody being immoral, we typically first go to sexual issues and, and sexual immorality. Then we might go to something like, you know, they, they embezzled money or, or they cheated or something like that. Um, we wouldn't typically think of somebody who was really immoral because they disrespected their parents and, and went off and, and married somebody that was not an approval of parents. That would have been immoral for them, uh, and so there's there's a much different set of values that's there, and so the immorality from a Christian perspective was deeply due to the fact that they were 
worshiping other gods and the idolatry that they had. Even their gods were, were uh, pursuing all the sexual immorality, what we would consider adultery and all that stuff, and their gods were doing that. So what was to prevent them from doing that? Uh, Dio Chrysostom, I had a printout. I printed it. Honestly, I did. But then Dave came into my office and kept talking to it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no. Yes. Uh, um, but I, I went to the printer and it was gone. I don't know where somebody put it. So I'll have it for you guys next week because I'm sure it will show up. Um, no. It's about a one-page quote from Dio Chrysostom. Um, but as he, as Dio Chrysostom uh, goes through, um, you know, I, let me, I, I can bring it up in Word. Let me just go like this real quick. Because I had it there. And I'm not going to be able to. I just remember that I can't do it. Because uh, it was attached to my exterior hard drive. And therefore, I can't read that from here. So, um, so yeah. So, with, with Theo Chrysostom, he goes through and he, he starts rebuking the morals of these brothels. You know, the, and, and all these different things. And when you're reading him, you're kind of like, oh... It sounds like they have morals back then. It sounds like there was something. But there's a couple things that you'll notice when you get the handout. One is that you look at his life period, and he actually was born into a world that was already starting to be Christianized in one of the most central areas for Christianity, which would be Asia Minor or modern Turkey. And so he's surrounded by Christians already by the time he's writing what he's writing. And it's probably, you know... The Christians had gotten to a point where, like, look at all that immorality, look at all of that stuff, and he was trying to come back with an argument based on pagan uh, philosophy and pagan thoughts that would show, you know, yeah, we, we can be immoral, just like we try to accommodate uh, evolutionists or we try to accommodate we tried to accommodate Aristotle, things like that. He was trying to show from a uh, pagan thing, no, we still can have uh, these morals. However, as he is talking about all that immorality, he's telling you it's at every gate, it's in front of everywhere, it's in every city, and it's, he's telling you this, it's, it's prolific. Uh, so you can see that the immorality uh, is there, and really the gods, you know, the, the gods couldn't really come out and say, you, you shall not do that, because they've been doing it for uh, eternity. So, um, so in that sense... Other than Chrysostom, we really don't have anyone speaking out against any sort of uh, immoral behavior on the sexual side of things. Uh, the Greek language itself has numerous words for sexual relations because it was so frequently talked about. Uh, and if you ever go to um, uh, see some of the stuff from Pompeii, uh, even, uh, even where we went um, out in L.A., they have the, um, the Getty Villa, which is a reconstructed uh, Roman villa from that time period, modeled on some of the stuff that they had at Pompeii and Herculaneum. And, uh, and so they have the paintings. And here, <laughs> here you, have, you look up and you see what they're decorating their ceilings with is stuff that is very immoral. You know, phalluses, if you guys know that word, it's just they're all over the place and you're like, really? Like, you want to eat dinner and look around and see that stuff on the walls? It's just, it's disgusting. Uh, but that's how common those thoughts were amongst everybody that you decorated your walls with it. Uh, and so, go figure. Um, homosexuality uh, was part of the culture back then. A little bit differently uh, than <coughs> it is with ours. Um the forms of homosexuality, there was the manifestation of, of homosexuality between two youths. Uh, and uh, this was actually fairly common, that while they were younger, uh, in their early teens, there would be, whether you called it experimenting or whatever, they would have these relationships between teenagers. Uh, and this may actually be um, almost more of what Paul is saying about the... the um, uh, the, the flee the lusts of you, the, the youthful lusts. We talk about your youthful lusts. Like when you were a teenager and you were trying out all that stuff and doing all those things and you just followed every desire, stop. You shouldn't be doing that. Even within the Greek culture and the Roman culture, there was a sense that once you became to adulthood, you, you needed to stop behaving that way. Uh, and um, But a lot of it had more to do with um, maturity, family, and legitimate children and inheritance 
than it had to do with the concept of uh, you know the oneness that we have in marriage and and so on and so forth. Um, and so the other one is the sexual manifestations of mentoring relations with youth, which we're going to get to at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and the, but the homosexuality between two full adults was not really accepted within the Greco-Roman culture um, and was frowned upon. And eventually, during some reforms that um, Augustus brought, it was made uh, illegal. There were laws made, how much they got enforced, there was exceptions and so on and so forth, so how effective they were. Um, but there are actual laws made about not uh, having the homosexuality of that sort. The practice of sodomy in Greco-Roman world was really frowned upon. Uh, and uh, that sodomy meaning a particular act of homosexuality. Uh, and so that was seen as, as uh, um, uncouth by, by almost everybody. Uh, but what was accepted was what is called pedestry. Uh, or pederasty, uh, and uh, this is the relationship we talked a little bit before of where you would have an older man who would have been that patron, and then you would have a younger man mm -hmm. uh, who was the client, but also he, the older man would be helping that younger man through all of his schooling and all of that other stuff, and, uh, um, and sometimes that was just nothing but kindness and generosity and a normal relationship, um, but sometimes there was actually a romantic uh, aspect to that, uh, and, uh, and what was expected from the younger person was favors for the uh, older person. Yes? Is that where pedophile comes from? I, a um, little bit, well, might, but I think, um, uh, I think it's a little bit, a uh, little bit different, um, but they, they are, the first part is, is related. Um, I know. But the, uh, when you when you have this relationship, I mean, they have um, you know love letters where almost like the love letters from between these relationships were very intense and almost more romantic than some of the ones you see with wives. Uh, and there's stories of you know uh, a very wealthy man you know just crying and wailing outside of the young man's house because he broke off the relationship and stuff like that. And so it's it's really kind of weird. But you if you've ever if you have you guys watched, um, uh, come on, Gladiator? So you'll, you'll notice there's the one senator there, and he has some young men that are right there that look quite effeminate. That was very common. Uh, and the, the, another thing to say, well, how, because there, there's a certain level of disgustingness to this uh, today, uh, but part of the Greek culture was this total fascination with the human body, but especially the male body. Uh, and you see it through the sports and the athletics. And so there was that sense of the, the young man having the attention that was something that, that may have been desirable for a young man uh, at that time. Uh, but that was the typical, more typical way in which homosexuality manifested itself. It was always involved some sort of youthfulness uh, within it. Uh, and it was not quite the same as what we typically think of uh, today. It definitely was not manifesting itself in any type of relationship that would have been called a marriage uh, in, in the ancient times. <clears throat> the family uh, in Greco-Roman culture uh, was a very tight-knit group, uh, and it would have included aunts, uncles, everybody. Uh, they would have had a common religious practice uh, and there would have been an economic interdependence. In other words, uh, it was you know, quite common that the uncle would bail you out or the mom would bail you out or this would help or you would help them when things got hard and everybody was all uh, together uh, in that. Uh, but it also could even be broadened out to slaves or the clients in the patron-client relationship. Uh, they would be almost seen as family and then friends sometimes uh, got into that so close that they also... Uh, were brought in and there was that interdependence uh, and commonality within the family. Uh, in Rome, <laughs> prior to the time of Christ, uh, in the time of the Republic, the family actually took care of a lot of the legal issues in the land. Like if you had uh, a conflict, if you had a divorce, if you had a marriage, if you had anything like that, 
it was the, the, the family and the head of the family that made all the decisions about those things. So if you wanted to divorce, uh, you, you had to get the permission of your, your, the father, the head of your family, to get divorced. And it wasn't a court issue that you had to deal with. Uh, but in 19, 19 BC, uh, just before Christ uh, uh, arriving, Augustus passed legislation trying to control the family uh, more and bring some of those things, some things that had been able to be decided by the family now under the government so that they could be uh, deciding those things. Now, a big reason why he was doing this is he was actually trying to force people to stay in marriage relationships that would uh, bear children. So it was actually to increase childbirth and increase the population because uh, his concern, I think, was that with all the contact with all the other nations, that they would start losing their identity and they, and they would be overwhelmed because they didn't have uh, enough people. So he really pushed uh, for their uh, to be children and such like that. So there are benefits uh, given to those who, who get married and have children. Uh, there's tax benefits, just as similar to today. We got the, the uh, families, you get tax deductions and stuff like that. So a lot of that was there. Uh, if you were a divorced woman, you had to get remarried. It was uh, they, uh, and they was there was great financial gain for you to get remarried because you'd be taxed heavier if you remained single. Uh, if you were a single guy and a bachelor, then you only got a portion of your inheritance. You wouldn't get your full inheritance. You had to have kids to have a full inheritance. Uh, and then there were bonuses if you had you know, two or three more kids. So there was a lot of effort um, on Augustus's part to, to press that. Now, because you're diving into personal stuff, especially at a time when they're like, this should be family, there was a lot of pushback. And so many exceptions were made within the government when people would uh, appeal to it that really this didn't have quite the effect uh, that Augustus thought that it would have. Uh, so there wasn't quite the increase in population uh, that they thought that would be there. Um, but one of the biggest, interest, most interesting things is that divorce being the case of the family explains why when we, when we talk about divorce in just a little bit, that divorce was relatively easy. Sometimes you just had to say, you know, we're, we're divorced. Now, that might come across as too easy in our mindset because you're like, oh, all you got to do is say that. Well, no, you've got to say that while your entire world is your family. All of your finances are interconnected, your house, your living, your job, everything's interconnected. All of your friendships and relationships. So for you to go, I'm, I'm just getting divorced, you were tearing apart your entire life. So it was not, uh, uh, even, even though when we get to where it says, you know, it used to be you could just say that, um, then uh, um, and be divorced, it still was very hard. <clears throat> the other thing here, um, is that, um, oh, my brain just, my head it and it just disappeared. Don't you guys hate that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, all um, the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it should, it should, uh, it should come back to me eventually here. Uh, but yeah, the, um, with the, with the government stepping into all of those issues of, of family, um, yep, it's not coming back. We'll move to the next slide. Hopefully it'll come back up. <laughs> So marriage uh, in the Greco-Roman uh, culture, um, basically, if you lived together uh, long enough, you were married, and that was in just about all the ancient societies. Uh, now, which marriage you were was different because there were different types of marriages. But if you if you lived together, uh, in fact, what you're going to see is that one of the one of the ways of of uh, um, marriage is just you live together for a year and. That means you're married, uh -huh. uh, and so from there on out. But that would, what that means is, uh, legally, if something happened and you broke things off, uh, then uh, um, you had. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So what what I was going to say earlier is, um, uh, when the when the government got involved in these family decisions, that's when divorce came up. And uh, I don't think I'm getting ahead of, I might be getting ahead, I'll, I'll wait and I'll see if I get ahead. Just uh, don't let me forget about talking to you guys about uh, the government and divorce. So, um, so um, if you consented to live together, that would result in marriage. We talked about that a few weeks back uh, in the sense that that's, 
Uh, that is what the meaning of concubine is. So the, the idea of a concubine is that somebody you were together with for a year, but there's no official wedding, no official marriage, no official contract between families. You just are together, uh, and uh, it doesn't mean there's no commitment. It just means that that's the type of marriage that it was. Uh, procreation of children was always the explicit object of marriage. Uh, and so uh, this is why um, we're going to see, and it'll maybe come up later, but I'll bring it up here. Uh, when it comes down to the issue of adultery, a, a, o, adultery could only be done if it was with a married woman. So in other words, a married man with a single woman did not constitute adultery. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is, back then, the issue was not the, you know, this romantic, you were unfaithful to me, and you didn't keep that oneness of love, the issue was you've defiled the line and now we don't know whose kid that might be. <laughs> and it's an issue of inheritance and legal lines and who gets to inherit things. That was the big controversy. And if you look in scripture and the way that it handles it, that's often a bigger part even within the scripture is the issue is, is that, you know, you're, uh, you, and this is, you know, in the passage we just covered, where it says, you know, if you divorce your wife, and, it, and I think, I can't remember which one it is in Matthew, but it's like, uh, it might even be the Mark version, but it's like, you cause her to commit adultery. Because why are you causing her to commit adultery? Because she has to get remarried. She mm -hmm. can't get by in the ancient world if she doesn't get remarried. But because you chose to divorce her, she has to go get remarried, and that's adultery. But it doesn't kind of come back the same way with the man uh, on that. Uh, but nor does it put that adultery at that point on the woman. It's on the husband who divorced her. It's not on her. Uh, and so, and that's kind of what that, that passage you know, is bringing out. But the issue of marriage really was you, you want to have legitimate children and pass those things down in the whole family and such like that. Now, most marriages were monogamous. But as the thing note here says, versus polygamous, not monogamous as in they were faithfully monogamous or that they, they only had uh, uh, sex with their, with their wife, uh, but they, the, <clears throat> you did not have many marriages uh, that were multiple wives at once. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there were those things. There was no law against it. Um, and when you look back in the ancient world and even through scripture, you see a lot of polygamous types of relationships. Again, showing that in the ancient world, it wasn't about, uh, you know, just this oneness and, and I don't ever want to have you have sex with somebody else. Because you look at, you know, Sarah going, here, take my take my handmaid. And you got Leah and Rachel, here, take mine. Hey, here, take mine. And competing. War of the wombs, I like to call it. It's like they, they sit there going back and forth, trying to see who's going to... There, the, there wasn't this sense of you're being unfaithful to me by having this relationship because legally their handmaid's children were theirs. It was all about having children and all about the inheritance and who, who would get that. And that was very common uh, in, in the ancient world. And, um, and so the, uh, the thing about multiple wives, however, is that not many men made enough money to have multiple wives because they couldn't afford more than one wife. Uh, and that's typically uh, what was the case uh, with that. Now, um, with, the, uh, um, with these monogamous marriages, uh, there was a lot of prostitution and adultery that was common. Uh, and divorce was exercised often in the Roman world, uh, more so by the wealthy. Or when it says here, at least by the wealthy, it's because no one records the divorces of the poor people. Um, so we don't really know. We don't have enough records to know how frequent it was um, amongst the poor. Um, but it was exercised a lot uh, by the wealthy. Uh, with that, you know, like for instance, um, you take Caesar. Uh, um, I'm trying to think if it was Julius Caesar or if we're, it was Octavius. Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus had married his sister off to Mark Anthony. And 
Caesar Augustus was fully aware of how much Mark Anthony was going around with Cleopatra and everything else like that. It wasn't until he married Cleopatra, and then you have this issue then of, okay, now you have a competing wife, and now it's a favor, and then he turned everybody against him. But Mark Anthony and all those guys were out philandering all around, and nobody cared until it had an issue with, now who's going to be heir, who's going to be this, and so on and so forth. Um, exactly. <laughs> uh, this divorce that was exercised in Greco-Roman, both men and women could initiate divorce. In Jewish culture, only men could initiate divorce. Uh, and so this may possibly be why in the Gospel of Mark, when it's teaching on divorce, Mark mentions if a husband divorces his wife or if a wife divorces her husband, because Mark is always known as kind of the, he's, he's writing to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, uh, and, uh, and whereas Matthew is writing more within the Jewish culture and in the Jewish mindset, and so when he's writing, uh, he, he only brings up, in both of his divorce passages, he only brings up the husband divorcing the wife, he never brings up the wife divorcing the husband, because in the one culture, both could divorce, in the other, only one could divorce. Um, now, <clears throat> the laws were that when a, a, uh, a husband divorces his wife, the dowry goes back to the wife's family. Now, you say, well, okay, so what? No, that dowry <laughs> is huge. Um, again, if I could, just, just for the sake of, of giving something that might be more relatable, the Downton's Abbey that, that we're watching, you have a husband who had this huge estate, marries the wife, who is a hugely wealthy American heiress, she brings the money, he brings the royal name. And so she, she kind of gains that, that family heritage and inheritance, but he needed the money to keep that family heritage and inheritance. So if he decides to divorce his wife, all that money goes back to her, he loses his whole estate, and so on and so forth. And in fact, in Downton's Abbey, you, if you're watching it, the, one of the big dramas comes from the fact that the only way that the British father would allow the wedding to occur is if the money could not be taken back. And so that becomes a major issue. Uh, but that's, and that's where I want you to see a lot of this still has to do with the family names, who's inheriting, what's the line, all of that stuff. Um, and that's why you see in the ancient world arranged marriages. You're not getting the marriages that come from just dating or whoever you want to go. And no, you don't go out and just marry some poor guy on the street because you were so in love with them because that was not going to go well with the family and the inheritance and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and so in the divorce, the dowry would go back to the woman. It was a big, huge money and contractual thing. Then you say, well, what's to prevent the woman from divorcing her husband? Well, the law was the children went to the husband. Oh, and I bet so, there was a lot of women that ended up in another area and said, oh, he was killed in this battle. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you, you, we know how you women are sneaky. Like, oh, we get myself in some trouble. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, <laughs> You're right, though. I do it. But yeah, so, um, but yeah, the children would go back to the father. And so the wife would be hesitant to divorce because she didn't want the children to go to the father. And the, the father would uh, lose the uh, dowry. Mm -hmm. So marrying age. Girls in almost all the ancient world were married in their teens. Uh, and probably, you know, most commonly about 16 to 18 range of, of marriage. It could go earlier, uh, um, could be later. Um, but usually by the time you're getting into the 20s, you're starting to worry you're going to be an old maid and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Greek men, however, married when they were around 30. Uh, and so typically you're having somebody who's 15 years older than you, uh, if you're a girl, uh, that, that you're getting married to. Uh, differently, in Jewish culture, the man was expected to be married around 18. And so there was a much closer... Uh, commonality of age when they got married, but occasionally then the women, the girls were also younger. They would get married, you know, 14 or, or 15. Uh, and, you know, a couple things to remember with this. Life was shorter back then. I mean, you know, 50, 60 was usually our, what would be our 80 and 90. 
Uh, and so mm. middle age, you're already hitting it at 30. So mm. this is, you know, it kind of puts it into some perspective. Um, what's interesting about this is that many times, you know, people are saying, you know, like, hey, uh, um, uh, they see Mary marrying Joseph, but they sometimes portray Joseph as a lot older, whereas Joseph would have been encouraged to get married much earlier than that and would not have been that much older than Mary. So what happened with Joseph becomes a more intriguing question, which we can't answer. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you also have, um, uh, with this then, the, the, in the Greek world where the person who is 30 marrying somebody um, who is quite a bit younger, uh, do any of you see an advantage in that? Yeah, women outlive men by about eight years. Okay, not in the ancient world as much. Mm -hmm. It was oh, it was less common. It's actually less common for women to outlive men. Uh, women typically survived the birth more often, so there would be more women. But also more women, as we're going to see, were were cast out uh, to infanticide. Uh, to what? In fact, killing the infant, putting them out in the field. Oh. So. Uh, so that would happen with a lot of, so it really balanced out. And in fact, it was probably a shortage of women population that finally led to them starting to value daughters more and the infanticide starting to fade some together with the onset of Christianity coming into the Roman Empire. But with the, with the marrying at like the 30 and the younger, it's like the, on the issue of like the respect and so on and so forth, the, the, uh, uh, the woman being much younger, the guy being older, he's already established. He has, you know, all the different things in, in, in life that he's uh, working on. And uh, and so it's like he's able to provide as opposed to like two of the same age, sometimes having more conflict uh, with the ability to, to respect. That's, you know, something that's there. One of the intriguing things for me is, you know, especially having uh, four daughters, is you start watching all these movies and older movies. And this is the age range you see at least. I mean, the, the, the guy in the movie is typically a good 15, 16 years older than the girl that, that's the love interest almost every time. And it, it amazes me, you know, that, that in the movie that's, that's just normal. We completely accept it. And, uh, but then you get into real life and it's just really weird. Uh, what do you guys, what do you, do you guys think it's weird? Five is probably good. Five is probably good. I, I think the, the yeah the man should be because then they're around the same mental age. Yeah, well my 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 dad's mom, her her first husband was twenty years older than her, so oh that was the talk. So I know it's <laughs> disgusting. Uh, well, I mean, the the uh, you know the interesting thing is like once you become an adult, you're kind of an adult, uh, and we actually see that a lot in our in our culture. Um, but basically what I want to, to bring out is like the 30 versus eight, that 30 to 18 gap is actually more common than we think. Uh, and we see it more often than we think. We're just used to seeing it. And, and so, yeah. Does, do women do the same thing all day? They, they want to marry younger women, um, men too. So, I mean, I don't think it's just... I don't know that do they that. do. I don't know many women who want to marry a younger guy because they can be really stupid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they can train them the way they want them now. I think it's financial. Yeah, well, ask, ask the women see how much they think that would work. Good morning. <laughs> I really want to know what's going through some of those heads right now. They have to be very independent to marry a young guy. You don't even believe it. Yeah. You don't yeah. believe it. Well, you, I, I tell you, you can ask you my wife, but I'm not supposed yeah, to let right. you guys know that she's older than me. So, um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> she'll, she'll hear about that eventually. Okay, me. But, um, yeah, so the, but basically you, you see with this, with the marriage within the Greco Roman circles, the older marrying the younger. And, and what you would see in the number of the characters we do know about, for instance, Herod's, uh, the marriage is happening within Herod's family. You're seeing that 15 year gap for sure in many of those marriages. Uh, and, and that was just common at that time. We look back and, and almost think it's abusive, but it's, it's, it was common. And it was common. What, what I say is this. It was so common that the women didn't really care. It wasn't like this is horrible or something like that. That was that was fine uh, for them. So the, what would happen, betrothal wise, the Greeks within Greek culture, there would be a formal pledge of the father with witnesses from both sides, uh, and the pledge would be the dowry that he would give with his uh, daughter uh, being married off, 
and uh, and then that dowry, once it was legally agreed upon, then the marriage uh, would be arranged, or the wedding would be arranged, and they would go about that. Uh, the Romans, there'd be an informal business agreement with witnesses, uh, and uh, but it was pretty easily renounced if something came up. The Jews had a betrothal that once that decision was made, once the families came together, what's the dowry going to be? What is, what is the agreement? And they made that agreement. That's it. You, the only way you get out of that is the same thing as a divorce. You had to go through all the same paperwork of a divorce and everything. And of course, this is why in Matthew 1, 18 to 19, when Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, he decides to divorce her quietly. You're like, divorce her? She, they weren't married because they were betrothed, and that betrothal had that level of force. Um, and if you broke that, it was, a, it was breaking a contract between two families uh, that would have brought a lot of conflict uh, as well. So the, um, real quick before we go too far from this, this um, the, the betrothal and the, and the arrangements and just breaking those off uh, within the Roman uh, and, and Greek. You know, see, my brain just stopped on me again. Oh, well. You guys will just be, have a fun time with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you turn 50. Just everything starts going on. It means 50 is with you, <laughs> sir. Yes, yes. So, um, so with, the, <laughs> with the Roman marriage, uh, there were two types of marriage. Marriage with manus uh, and marriage without manus. Now, manus is just hand. Uh, and that means you're kind of under the hand of your husband. In other words, there's a there's a, a kind of legal sense of where there's a subordination legally to, to the husband. Uh, this is always fun when I do weddings, something that somebody did to me in my wedding, so I do it to them, is I'll take the groom's hand, not during the ceremony, usually at the reception, but I'll take the groom's hand and I'll say, take the wife's hand, bride's hand, and then take the bride's hand and put the groom's hand. I say, okay, see that? It's the last time you're gonna have the upper hand. So, <laughs> so uh, but the uh, this marriage with Manus um, was primarily done in the older Republican days of the Roman Empire, uh, and so with Manus meant there was a legal agreed upon subordination to the husband, uh, and the wife was officially transferred to her family. Now the subordination here, um, I think, might almost be the wrong word the there's a there is a sense with this manus of where when the wife comes uh, under the husband there is a very strong legal binding agreement that he is responsible to care for her mm -hmm. he is responsible to make sure she is doing okay yes she is subordinate to him but it's like there's a sense of legally her money becomes his but the, he has to take care of her her things become his legally, but he has to care. So it's a, it's a way it's all legal. This isn't like, you know, the, you know in, this, in this marriage, the husband had control, and in the other marriages, the husbands were just, you know, not in control of anything. Uh, it's, it, this is a legal agreement that has to do with her finances uh, and, and property. Uh, and in this way, the, the bride is officially transferred from her family to his, so the family, the other, the bride's family, loses legal claim on any of her property or on any of her things. Uh, they couldn't come in and sue if that bride dies and say that's ours because we're like, no, she's in that family. She's not part of your family uh, anymore. Uh, and then that's where that payment of the dowry uh, uh, you know, would also go. And that was the daughter's portion of uh, the inheritance um, that she would, you know, she brings that in. That is given fully to the new family and becomes the new family's uh, and it's her portion of the inheritance from her family, and, it, and it's gone. So it's no longer legally part of, the, of her original family. So that's what it meant to have a marriage that was uh, with Manus. So under that type of marriage, there was uh, uh, the uh, Conferatio. Uh, and this uh, it involved basically the big religious ceremony. This is the official one. This was how you... You would typically see the ideal um, marriage. Uh, there was quantio, which is the sale of the woman to her husband. Uh, and this would be the, the difference here with the sale of the woman to her husband uh, is that she, if you're from a poor family and you have no dowry to give at all, uh, 
and and mm-hmm. instead you're kind of taking away someone from mm-hmm. their family that would ha- would have uh, you know be able to provide for something, mm-hmm. then there would be the ability to buy the the bride from her family. Now that does not always mean that it's not like a slave thing. It's not always an issue of you know there was no love or anything. They could have been in love, but her family was so poor that this type of thing uh, would happen. Mm-hmm. But when that happened. And the woman became, came, she completely, she was no longer part of her family, no longer had legal claim on, on the heir to that family's fortune. Uh, and so, you know, this, this may sound a little too shallow, uh, but if you had, a, for instance, a daughter who no one was marrying, no one was interested in, <laughs> and so on and so forth, uh, but then there's that thing of what is she going to, you know, what is she going to do? And sometimes, you know, if she met somebody and they would be willing to do this, uh, then she would actually just at least have a husband. Uh, now, because of, again, our romantic ideas with marriage, it's like, how could you ever be in a marriage where it was like you just went into that relationship? But you're not living in a world where if you aren't married, have fun getting by, have fun having a house. Have fun having the money. How are you going to? This was not a, a world that was structured financially for you to be able to survive, and so the you know you would. It's like either old maid poverty and 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 possibly uh, begging, versus someone agrees to marry you. Now you're provided for. You have a house. You have clothes and and food and so on and so forth. Uh, the third one here is the the uh, usus or uh, us us like it's a. Just sounds like a little kid trying to explain marriage. Us, us. Um, but, so, uh, and this is just if you live together uninterruptedly for one year, the idea is the marriage that would come from that during the during the republic. If you if you did that, then that she automatically became part of the the husband's family. And again, why why was this important? Because you would have then um, uh, the legal claims. So let's let's say uh, you have a, uh, a son who is the son of somebody who's really wealthy, and then the daughter, you know, comes and uh, and they end up getting getting married or just they end up just living together, um, because the the other the parents of the wealthy kid are not approving of it. Uh, then the other parents could come and say, well, we're part of your family and we get some of that inheritance, and isn't this some of our? And it's like no. Because this, once that happened, they lived together for that year. Legally, she's now part of this family, and there can be no claim of that. Uh, and so that's where a lot of this comes into the idea of the manus. Roman marriage without manus was more like our marriages today, and this became popular after the empire. Um, so one thing that may have added to that is the number of unapproved marriages because you have people of all different nation nationalities coming in and they're falling in love or whatever and and the parents don't approve or or we didn't want to have that but it just it just became less and less common to have the structured marriage also you'd have the different marriage traditions from all the different cultures uh, that would impact it as well these marriages were based on mutual consent in other words they both came together they agreed to be married but no legal agreement is made between the families of the same level where she's fully abandoning her inheritance and he's fully abandoning his. And that's the way it is today. You know, Joy still is full heir to anything from her parents, and I'm still full heir to anything from my parents, and she could possibly get some from my parents, and I could possibly get some from her parents, depending on how what would happen with our lives and such. So it's it's a much more balanced in that sense. Uh, and uh, um, but then that also results in a lot of the conflict that you see about inheritance that comes up nowadays. Uh, go through, you know, go visit a family three weeks after the funeral and see how well they're all getting along because that's how it always gets interesting. <laughs> so um, and eventually this became really the only type of marriage under the empire. So this was the type of marriage that was becoming more com- uh, common. Uh, um, in the time of the first century when the New Testament uh, is being written. The other marriages did still exist, though. So with the marriage ceremonies, a uh, couple would clasp hands with formulas of marriage uh, being pronounced. Uh, the marriage contract would be read before a witness and signed by them. And then Juna, or Hera, depending on whether you're talking Greek or Roman, Juno was with Rome, Hera was with the Greeks. Um, I also got that flipped. 
uh, and she's seen as providing over the ceremony. So she was the wife of Zeus or Jupiter, uh, and so she was seen as the goddess over marriage, and so you would typically see uh, that. You'll see it on the, the next slide. I have a picture of it. Um, the bride would formally then be taken from her mother's arm and then conducted in a procession to the groom's house, uh, and at the groom's house, he would, she would be carried over the threshold, but oft, also at the groom's house, there would sometimes be a ceremony that was done there, and then finally go into the house, and then they were, they were then uh, married. Uh, and so this uh, conducting the bride by torchlight, because the first part of the ceremony and the party and everything at home, uh, uh, or at her home, would have gone on for a while, and then in the evening, they'd have been conducted by, by that um, torchlight procession. This is what um, we're coming up pretty soon. Well, not too soon, but we're coming up on the parable of um, the those that were waiting with the lamps and whether they had enough oil. And so it's like they were waiting for this procession to come by so they could join and go and have enough oil to make the whole length of the procession. Uh, and so some brought extra oil because they knew they might be waiting a while. The others didn't. Uh, and this is what it's talking about, this procession from the, the um, bride's home to the groom's home. Uh, within the Jewish weddings, it was at the, um, uh, is at the front door that they would have the, uh, the kind of the umbrella and do another ceremony uh, there as well. And then typically after this happened, there would be a week of festivity. So like the wedding in Cana, don't think you went for an evening and it was just a reception. This was a feast and they were running out of wine for the whole whole week and that of uh, festivities um, that they had. Uh, they did have some times within the culture where the bride and groom would go straight in and then come out carrying a sheet proving that uh, there was an innocence there. Uh, and uh, you know, I was wondering, like, as if that would not be hard to fake, but oh well. Uh, and so, uh, so that was sometimes part of the ceremony. Here you see within the art, we actually do see a lot of, of marriage uh, ceremony stuff in the art here. The bride is being uh, taken to the groom's house, and here she's in a cart, probably showing a bit of wealth, but people will be going along with the torches as she's uh, carried there. And then this shows you, this is the Juno or Hera, standing in between holding uh, um, them and, and blessing the marriage and the union. And the two of them are holding the hands, making the vows uh, and such. So <clears throat> next uh, we have the place of women in the ancient world. Um, this is an, kind of an interesting subject because Nowadays, women's studies has taken a huge <coughs> increase of going back into the ancient world, going back in, into a, a lot of different eras and studying women and what was happening with women and, and uh, uh, finding different things out. Um, these are statements that are made during this time. Uh, the first one, we have courtesans for pleasure, handmaids for the day-to-day -day care of the body, wives to bear legitimate children, and to be trust, a trusted guardian of things in the house. So you have this, this sense, you're like, what? But the courtesans for pleasure, not always just sexual pleasure, the courtesans would be the women, you would go to a, a party, and these parties would be for men, and then at that party there would sometimes be somebody who is dancing, there would sometimes be somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, comes out to, to sing or to do uh, a musical performance. There's a number of things. This is, for instance, when Herod um, uh, um, Antipas ha has his uh, daughter come out and, and dance for them, uh, and she dances well. There does not have to be anything sexual about it. It's just the, those are kind of courtesans, women that were in the court while the men were there. Now, many of them were actually there for other things, uh, that we would consider immoral, um, and that was kind of part of the kind of depended more on who you were with and what the party was, uh, and uh, so that's so courtesans did have that. The handmaidens for the day to day care of the body uh, would be the idea of the the people who come in and help care for the clothing and everything else, and, and so on and so forth, uh, and then uh, the wives to bear legitimate children and to be trusted as the guardians of all things in the house. And that latter part, the wives really were seen as the manager and almost head of the house, 
the husband was was head of the family she was kind of like head of the house and so she managed all of those things and often had lucrative businesses uh, mm -hmm. as as women um, and actually we see in scripture many times where women there are powerful women but wealthy women uh, who are functioning within society and having a huge influence the second one here never while their men survive is feminine subjection shaken off and they themselves abhor the freedom that the loss of husband and fathers produces so the idea is as soon as you pass from the the being under your father you went right from under your father to being under your husband now, first of all, that sounds oppressive right off the bat. But what you also have to realize is that with that headship and that being under father or under husband, was their responsibility to care for you, clothe you, feed you, everything. They had to pay for all of those things and, and do all of those things. Uh, and when he says here, and they themselves abhor the freedom that the loss of husbands and father produces. I understand this is a man saying this, but there's a lot within the ancient world to say that was actually the case uh, because they knew that without that that care there was not much options of what they could do uh, in life and so they did not want to have that freedom to just go and do all of what they they wanted uh, and they wanted to be in that relationship that was there i mean you even see the very fact that like with leah and even though this is much before this but with leah and rachel it's like they intentionally get Leah to marry Jacob ahead of Rachel so that she has that. And Leah wanted that. She wanted to have uh, that from what we can tell. Uh, and so uh, there is that desire to at least be married. Uh, again, if you want on the modern side just to be able to watch something that would give you a different sense of this, if you watch the, the, the Downs Abbey, uh, you'll see the one daughter who doesn't, can't find somebody and you see her wanting to and she's almost at the point you know being willing to marry some guy that's you know 40 years her senior 30 years her senior in order to just not be unmarried and uh and but when you the reason why i say that is because uh, to watch it in that sense not because i approve of the whole show but it's so hard for us to grasp that anybody would want that it's so hard for us to think because we're in such a romantic culture that how could you even feel that way but that is a great deal of, of how it was uh, back then. Um, and it says, and they, have, uh, they themselves abhor the freedom. Uh, oh, I know I was going to say, the, if you look in the Old Testament law, um, there's an interesting thing within the law that shows that this was also true within the Jewish culture, uh, in that if a, if a daughter makes a vow, and promises, you know, Lord, if you do this, then I'll offer this or I'll give this. The father has the right to say, no, you can't do that vow. Now, if the father says, no, you can't do that vow, but the vow is good and right before God, then the guilt of that vow goes on the father, not the daughter. So the daughter, you know, as soon as she, as soon as she listens to her father, she's free of all the responsibility of that decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now the, now the responsibility is on the, on the father. And what it says is that once she is married, the husband can do the same thing. So the husband can say, no, we're not going to do that vow. And she's freed of that responsibility um, of the vow. So you see within the Jewish culture, there is still that same thing of, of you went from being under the father to being under the, under the husband. And again, just to realize that under the husband, there was a lot of things where they took responsibility for things. It was not all just oppressiveness uh, and just out of the love the husband would have for the wife which we do see plenty in history that shows even though many of these marriages were arranged the husband had a lot of affection for the wife and or vice versa um, one of the interesting ones for me uh, is when Michael was being returned to David which actually was against the law by the way uh, but when Michael was being returned to David, Michael, Saul's daughter, uh, was being returned to David as, as a wife, the husband that she had had in between is following after her, you right. know, weeping. And so you, you do see this love of husbands and, and stuff like that. Uh, and, and it was, a, they, wives were a cherished thing. Uh, it's just, this, is, this has more to do with a responsibility uh, issue than I'm going to be overbearing and cruel. So while wives... Um, 
sometimes you, you get the sense that uh, Greek women were kept in total seclusion. Now, a big part of that comes from the fact that if you do go see something from Pompeii and, and or something from the Greek world, they're going to tell you that within the house there was a location that was, this was just for the women. And the women had this place upstairs that was for them. Um, and, uh, and so therefore they were kept uh, uh, under wraps. That was actually something they wanted, but it also was something to guard against legitimacy by not letting a man up into that area. Uh, and, and that actually was uh, pretty common, uh, um, and, and they wanted that. Um, the, it primarily meant they, to protect the legitimate children. So the, the women, when the husband was gone, the wife was the ruler of the house over all the servants, over all, uh, even the men in the house. She was the one who, who ruled that house. Uh, and many of them governed, uh, if they were wealthier, their husbands were actually gone on trips a lot, and they were governing and had a lot of, of money and influence and, and were able to make uh, decisions. Uh, and so that influence was actually exercised often. Um, now, some of the times we see this uh, influence, uh, Jesus, for instance, during his ministry, have, has a number of wealthy men, women who are with him, who are providing for him and taking care of him, and even from pretty high, uh, high officials' homes uh, and such like that. <clears throat> when Paul is in um, Lydia, I think it is, um, so somewhere in Galatia, in his in his uh, um, first missionary journey with Barnabas. Uh, they get up into that area, and <clears throat> the Jews are are really upset at what Paul is teaching. So what they do is they get the prominent women of the area to go and fight on their behalf with the government. And so you can see within that that the women had a lot of power and a lot of sway because of the money that they had and their ability to to, to move that around and, and, and business women. And that, that's pretty common. You read about things like that. Uh, frequently. Um, when we went through the life of Herod uh, um, and talked about how he got into different rough times, uh, and I think it was Herod specifically, Herod Agrippa the first, it was because his mother was connected to Livia, who was a very powerful woman in Rome. She was the one bailing him out. Not her husband. She was bailing him out. Uh, so you see in scripture a lot of these powerful women uh, we read about these powerful women all throughout the history. And so there were many women that were actually very powerful. And on the average, uh, um, in, the, um, in the culture, uh, women were, were actually highly respected. We, there's a lot of epithets that talk about their mother and how she was respected and how she was honored and these things. So, so we see a lot of things that show that women were honored. Um, however, because of the fact that, you know, if you're outside of marriage, this is a much more physical world. You know, you have to be able to be a soldier. You have to be able to protect yourself. You have to be able to work the ground. You have to, there's a lot more of those things that, that set women at a disadvantage. Uh, and so, though, if you weren't wealthy or didn't have the means to get into a sort of trade and such, uh, then, then it could be um, pretty rough. But actually, many women did that. That's what you see in Proverbs 31, you know, the big passage they always go to guilt trip all you women to try to be better mm -hmm. uh but you go to proverbs 31 and it talks about selling things in the gate and doing all these different things and being very industrious and that was extremely common uh back at that time and so it really i think sometimes you read what some of the men wrote about women and think that characterizes how women were all treated back then but that was just men being men uh, a lot of times the women actually had uh, a life that was you know, something they actually desired uh, and enjoyed. Now, between the different groups, the Athenian women uh, were the lowest in status. Some of that may have had to do with their mythology that women were created as a punishment to men because they made too much noise and Zeus was bothered by them. So he created a, a woman, uh, uh, Pandora, and she just had to open that box of everything. So. Um, so that, that, that probably pointed to that low status. Um, and that does actually, you know, your thoughts of origins does impact things. When a missionary went to South America and taught them about creation and how woman was made, they were shocked because in their mythology, women were completely different creatures. They weren't even human. 
And so they were seen as so much lower. And when they found out that they weren't, that they were taken from the same thing and Adam saying, it's my flesh, my flesh, it actually changed the entire tribe. And women started to be treated um, much better. Macedonian women, so Athenian would, would be um, kind of southern end of Greece, Macedonian's northern, modern Greece. Uh, they had a greater status, uh, and, uh, and that helped bring up the Athenian women over time. Uh, and then the Roman women had kind of taken up where those left off and gained even more status so that they eventually, by the time the first century comes around, women had a pretty high status within the culture. Um, you see this actually with, you know, Cleopatra, you see it with Hero uh, Herodias, you see it with various women uh, where they definitely knew how to influence things. <clears throat> the wealth uh, of some women uh, in Rome allowed them to become patrons and exercise a good amount of, a great deal of influence even over emperors at times. Uh, uh, they also frequently were holding civic offices. They served as priestesses, they were physicians, artists, musicians, athletes, and so um, within the Roman world and the first century world, uh, they actually were having jobs outside of the home in various different ways. Uh, they participated in sales, manufacturing, and commercial activities. Who's one of our biggest ones from scripture that was a woman who uh, was in manufacturing and commercial activities? Lydia. Lydia, yeah, yeah. seller of purple. Okay. Uh, it was, and she was extremely uh, wealthy, most likely. With Jewish women, uh, they were not as restricted in public appearance, uh, and in, in, in the sense that they were out in public more often. Uh, they had a lower legal status than many of the Roman women, so they couldn't divorce their husbands, uh, and, uh, and and so there was legal ways that they were um, um, less progressive than the other thing, other worlds, but they were able to actually participate in public and so on and so forth much easier uh, than the Greeks did. Uh, women were exempt in within the Hebrew uh, culture. Women were exempt from various religious obligations due to ritual impurity and child care. So when the rabbi has the prayer, which some of you have probably heard, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who has not made me a woman, the idea with that was not to sit there and go, women are terrible. It was, I long to be in your house so much that I'm glad I'm not a woman who has all those days of impurity and things like that where she can't go and be in your house. It's, it's, it's just a very different tone. We take it totally wrong because we're out of context uh, with the culture. So the roles of Jewish men and women uh, typically... So the wife would do meal preparation, the husband would provide the food and the clothing, she would do the spinning of wool, uh, um, the husband maintained regular sexual relations, uh, the wife would maintain the home, uh, and the husband would provide for the children, she would maintain an attractiveness, he would, uh, these are things that came out of the, the Jewish writings of the time, and then the, wife, uh, the husband is forbidden to strike his wife, uh, and the, influ the wife, the influence on the family is probably greater than the husband's. So what you see is within Jewish culture, there's a lot more protections of women. Uh, there actually is uh, um, a lot more respect for the women's and the roles. Uh, and the husband, which you'll see here again, the, it's not like the husband's going off to work and the wife is staying home. The idea is they both have different roles in managing the home. The, the, the husband is there, he, a lot of it is farming. And, and again, this is a more agrarian society all the way around. So more often what you have is they both are working in the home, but one's doing one role, the other's doing uh, the other role, and they're seen much more as complementary. Not one gets to go do this while the other one is stuck doing this. Children in this time, um, and actually before, before I get to that, um, the... Um, I'll, I'll wait and do it at the end. So, uh, so children, the uh, child mortality rate uh, was high in the ancient world, uh, and even higher because instead of abortion, uh, they had um, this practice of exposing unwanted babies. Um, so, Healing. what's that? Healing unwanted. They would leave it out in the field and. It's an animal. Let it die. Yeah. Oh. Well, there's an animal. They got too cold, yeah. mostly. Yep, they usually would, they would starve or they would, they would die of exposure. Um, 
the, the you see that the actually um, this practice is brought out in Ezekiel when God uses it as a picture of Israel. He says, I was going through a field and I found you there in your afterbirth and, oh. and I picked you up and I washed you and I cleaned you. In other words, he found an exposed baby and that actually hap would happen. Uh, so some people would expose the baby, others would come along, find the baby and take the baby. You can remember from our discussion you know, last week, talking about slavery, some took the baby and it became kind of a slave within the house. Some took it and adopted it. Some, they, there was a variety of different ways that um, that baby was taken. This factors into you know some of the the writings of the Greeks. We talked about Oedipus Rex before about how the 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 king had a prophecy that his son was going to kill him, so he had the son put out in a field, but the man couldn't do it. He couldn't leave it out there, so he took it and, and gave it to someone else who took care of the the child. Uh, so this this exposure actually factors into a number of stories in the ancient world because it was fairly common, um, and uh, you. They did attempt abortions, but mm. more often than not, abortions were failures and mm. fatal. So because of that, uh, it was far more common to have to carry a full term uh, and expose the child. Um, the child's life in the ancient world, you know, we talk today in debate, when does a life begin? Uh, in Greco-Roman society, the child's life began when the father acknowledged it. What? And so if the father didn't acknowledge it and didn't accept it, then that child wasn't, and it was a scene not as murder, but as a rejection from the family. And it wasn't seen that way. Um, you'll notice in the quote that you guys have that I gave you at the very end of the lesson from Josephus, within Jewish law, this was murder. So it's not that no one in the ancient world saw it that way. The Jews saw it that way. Basically, if you had a child, you're going to have a child. Um, there was nothing that you could do either abort or exposing. Um, a big reason why this is done is you're living in a world where it is a very real situation of having too many mouths to feed, where that uh, additional person to your family, what are you going to do to be able to take care of them? You're barely having enough food to feed who you have now, uh, and so that, that would fed into this. Um, the first child was seldom exposed unless it was an illicitly conceived child, uh, and uh, but after the first child, if you had, uh, if you had like a girl or uh, if you already had a boy and then you have a girl, the girls would often be uh, exposed. Um, the girl meant not only we got to feed another mouth, but eventually we have to somehow compile a dowry, pay it and give it to somebody. Uh, and it was just, it was seen as, as too much. Whereas the boy meant, you know, if nothing else, an eventual soldier and he could make money and things like that. Children were seen to be children uh, um, until they reached maturity, which for uh, a Jewish child uh, would be around the age of 14 or 15 when they had their bar mitzvah that make them a son of the law. Um, but it was definitely when, you know, once you were married. Um, but for um, uh, Greco-Roman, for the girl, it's when you were married, then you were now an adult and not a child. For the boy, you registered when you were as a citizen at 17, and then you were you were seen as adult after you registered uh, as a citizen. Um, the one thing that I was waiting to kind of uh, mention, just I didn't know if it would come up at a at a at one of these slides, but when you look at um, when you look at some of these issues with the women and the propriety of the women and so on and so forth, realize that. In many ways, the women themselves were the ones that kept this tradition going. Not always the men. Even today, if you look today, and uh, I don't know how you guys will respond to this because I haven't had this discussion with you guys, uh, but even today, when you look at the propriety of how women dress and how young women dress and so on and so forth, it's typically the women I hear the compliment or the comments from about how something is inappropriate. I don't hear it from the men. Uh, it's, it's the women coming saying that's not really appropriate, we should do something about the, you know, things like that. And there is a sensibility, you know, amongst the women of what's proper amongst women. And, and there's a whole way of thinking amongst women. And back in the ancient world, that's how a lot of this was. These women who were, they were the wife, and so they were the ones who the legitimate children uh, came. They may have known about those other relationships, but she had that pride of place because she was the legitimate wife. She was higher in society. She had management of the home. So I know she, 
the, the, the other issues weren't the main thing. Like she had a great place of pride to have her position versus that other woman was just, you know, you might say a floozy or something like that. And it, it just didn't have the same uh, uh, impact. And then some of the, the things within, uh, uh, you know, like women staying within the house and staying up in the thing, it was usually the women who would push for that to be the case because of the propriety and stuff like that. And they had that sense. It wasn't always the men that were pushing for it. And that's often lost sometimes because we go back and we, we read this stuff and it's like, man, the men did all this. It's like, no, it was, it was a structure of society that was being upheld by everybody. Uh, not just the men. Uh, and so uh, and that often happens. So, all right, so we have uh, about 20 minutes till 8, and we don't have to go all the way to that, but I wanted, like I said, I wanted this time to leave a little bit of time for questions. So, yeah. Uh, in the scripture, uh, Jesus is challenged by Pharisees, I guess, mm -hmm. about the, the situation of the woman whose husband dies and she marries the brother and the brother and the mm -hmm. brother. Was that just a one-off situation, or was there some tradition either in Jewish culture or Greek or Roman? Of the tradition that? for that is actually Jewish, and it's the kinsman redeemer, um, in that if, if, a, if a woman marries a man and the husband dies before she has any children, then it's the next in line relative that has to marry her and provide a child, but it would be actually the child for the first brother so he has a name for himself uh and again this is this is one of those interesting things because when we when we sit down and think about you know that um the relationship of the marriage and it's like you know you can't uh you you can only have have you know sex with your spouse and that's it and that's you know the kinsman redeemer is really interesting boaz when he marries ruth may have had and probably did have another wife when he marries ruth and so it's, and yet we often make it this big, huge romance, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and uh, you have, um, you know, the, the concept of kinsman redeemer is, you know, you're, you're, you're already married, but your brother does that, so you have to provide a child for them. And there's not this other sense that's there of, of you're committing adultery on your wife because you're providing a child for your brother. And so it's really kind of a strange thing for us in our modern mentality. But the kinsman redeemer would have brought about that situation of, the one husband died, so the brother married it. And the, the reason why it's the brothers that are doing this is because it's the it's the kinsman redeemer, most likely, is what they're trying to say. Now they're taking it to a degree of seldom. I, I don't think ever in history some woman married seven brothers. Uh, they, but that's just part of their argument. So it probably would have been like yeah. two or three, but it's set up anyway. Right. And clearly, we all know she'd be the, she'd be in heaven. She'd be the wife of the one she liked the most. That's the, <laughs> that's <good. laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So, okay, you're cute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not my question. Um. So, like. Oh, you're talking about the baby being. No. Cute. Yeah, the baby. <laughs> yeah, you're not cute by any. No, I'm kidding. Okay. So my question is, when we get to heaven, and like my spouse Brian dies, okay, uh -huh. am I allowed to remarry, or is that between There's me no and There's no marriage him? in heaven. No, I mean like here on earth. Am oh. I allowed to? Yes. Go be happy even though he has passed on to the afterlife. Yes. If you, or am if, I going to be stricken with guilt? No, like, no. I mean, well, you can't change your guilt because some people feel guilty even if Scripture is not against it. But from a biblical point of view, once your spouse is dead, you are free to get remarried. And in fact, uh, from Scripture's point of view, if you are a, a younger widow, you are you should get married. So now. That's being said so that you have someone to take care of you and so on and so forth. And because back in that time, you, you couldn't make it on your own. Nowadays, people choose to do that, but they, they're fine because they can make it on their own. They, they can have a job and stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, you made a comment earlier about uh, it wasn't wrong for a man in adultery. In the examples in the Bible, it's always a woman that's caught in adultery. Mm -hmm. Is that in the Jewish custom only, or is that everyone? So, I mean, adultery, it typically is the woman. Now, the rest of it would be what we call fornication. So it's not okay. It's not like, oh, it's fine for a guy to go have a relationship with another woman. It's like that's still fornication. That's still sexual immorality in Scripture. But adultery 
has more to do with the um, um, husband's feeling of jealousy. It says not, that in in the the inheritance one. What's the verse with the jealousy? That's that's in the tabernacle of Moses. If a man feels like he had the jealousy over his wife, then they're to bring him into the oh, temple and yes. that whole ceremony. Yeah, yeah. So if a husband Where so she has a, to drink ashy water. Yeah. And and the um you know, and that and that jealousy, you know, that that's there, um, has to do with the, the fact that you are you're mine and and you're but you're going and offering yourself to somebody else. A so the thing with the woman though is the, because the woman is the one having the children when she's married, then it's the legitimate children and inheriting the land and knowing who was in that line for inheriting land was a huge thing as well. And so, uh, and so when, um, when you have the issue of it being adultery, it has to do with the wife who, who could be having those children because I mean, who's the father? Yeah. I mean, cause here, here's the thing. <laughs> Until the New Testament, no injunction is given against multiple wives. Now, the kings are told, don't multiply wives, and don't do that. But Moses had two wives, and Jacob had four, and Abraham had three. And, you know, it's like there's, there's, no, there's no, you know, this is wicked for you to have more than one wife uh, during that time. Deuteronomy 17, 17, no, that one says, don't have, for the kings, don't have too many wives. Right, yeah. And the, the idea of the multiplying of wives has to do with, um, again, you're making treaties and you're building relationships with other nations mm -hmm. and stuff, uh, and the, what that would then bring in. And the foreign wives became a major issue of what led Israel astray. But you have many times where the multiple marriages were due to kindness toward, toward the woman so that she would have someone to marry and so on and so forth during that time. But again, that was the people who were well to do. You honestly could not afford to have more than one wife, uh, and I don't mean that just even as a joke. It's like you couldn't. It was you had to have a lot of money to have that many wives and kids and everything to be able to feed all of them. So that's why polygamy was not a common thing. Uh, and uh, but you see, uh, you know, when Moses has two wives and they have they have these the the the, the multiple wives, it's not seen as adultery because this is still a. You know, a man and a woman have a child, you know whose child it is, kind of thing. Versus when you have the, the married woman, she's already married and another man comes in. Now whose child is it? There's, there's no sense of inheritance. There's no sense mm -hmm. of who they are, no sense of identity. So it's almost more of a, uh, an emphasis on the child and the, and the line and, and things like that than on the romantic idea of, of it has to be just like, you know, the relationship, sexual relationship, has to only be with this one person, or you can't have marriage at all. No, when they, the woman was caught, they were going to stone her. Yeah. Is that the same with the prostitute? I mean, that's adultery too. But well, you said the, it's the woman that was caught in adultery would have had she would, have, she would have been married. Okay. So she wasn't. She wasn't caught having. You know, we don't know about the guy whether he was single or whether he was married or whatever. But she was clearly a wife and was caught uh, in, in, uh, having that relationship. And that's what I'm saying is that, is that because of, of the way it usually functioned, the, it was adultery because um, it wasn't, it's another, if, if, the, if the woman's not married, this is just, it's immorality. The main thing you're impacting is the jealousy. You're mainly impacting this sense of, of hurt and your yeah. relationship with your wife and that's, and that's immorality and so on and so forth. Adultery is the next step up because now you're even you're you're going beyond even that to how it impacts the family and the line and the inheritance and everything. So it doesn't it's not meant to I don't mean it to, to like cheapen the other fornication and say this is okay and adultery is only bad. It's just distinguishing here's fornication, here's adultery. Adultery typically is involving more than just more than just sexual immorality and fornication. It's also involving screwing up inheritance and family and a whole bunch of other stuff. So is it the husband that usually brought the charge up against him? Um, usually was, was uh, the husband that would bring the charge. Um, one of the things I was trying to remember earlier to tell you is that um, when Augustus uh, started to bring laws 
down on the issues of marriage and so on and so forth to try to increase population and so on and so forth. Um, at that point, uh, the um, if if the husband had an illicit relationship outside the marriage, the wife under under Augustus couldn't charge him with with a crime, but someone else could. So another man could come in and go. He had an illicit relationship, so it could be her brother, it could be her father, it could be the relative of the woman that the man was with. They could actually come. So in that sense, in that sense the illicit relationship was wrong by the law, but it had to be brought by somebody other than the, the wife. So that's under Augustus, not Scripture. Dwayne, when uh, Jesus went to the temple with his parent, with Mary and Joseph, and he was 12 years old, was that mean that was the only time, that's the age that they could go and worship at the temple, or that, that, that didn't consider him to be a man then? Um, you could go into the temple, you could be in the court of Israel, even as a child. So um, the, uh, the, yeah, the court of Israel, um, and then the court of the women, and then the court of the men, and then the court of the priests, and so on and so forth. So I think if I got that right, but basically, definitely the children could be in the court of the women, but all of those courts were developed during the intertestamental time. Um, there's no evidence that they were there during Solomon's temple. There's no evidence they were part of the tabernacle whatsoever. Um, it was developed more after the intertestamental time, a lot to keep the Gentiles out because they felt the corrupting influence of the Gentiles, um, but then also you know the women and everything that because that seems to be more anti-women and put women at a lower thing, but that's not from Scripture. Scripture didn't ever say have those different courts. So. When you said Augustus wanted the Roman population to increase, but here they had been practicing killing the girls, right? Mm -hmm. Because we probably thought the other nations were having more kids and they were going to need these people, these right. children for combat, right? Yep. Uh, when in the... Um, you know, and that's why, you know, with having an overabundance of guys wasn't as, you know, big of a deal so as you think, because when you have the combat, that that definitely lessens the number of guys. Uh, and so it was, you know, that was kind of common. It actually is interesting because during the first century in the, gr in the Greek world, um, one child families were very, very common. So it was, it was not unlike China where they started to go down to like the one child policy and actually, like, started to enforce some of that, um, and uh, but they there it was just kind of socially enforced because people wanted to have that one child and to do as much with that one child. They might have two sons, so that in case something happens to the one son, they're still left with an heir. Um, and I guess part of what I'm trying to uh, part of what I'm trying to get across when we're thinking about these things is in the ancient world. The concern about who's going to be your heir was huge, but far more than what it is here. And, and you don't have to go that far back in our world to get to that point. Because what happens, you come to America, and what do you have in America? Land. Land, land everywhere. You get to Europe, there's the families that have land, and there's the families that don't. Mm -hmm. And that's it, because land's all taken. Uh, and that impacts the culture, that impacts value systems, that impacts a lot. And so there are emotions about things that, you know, things that would upset them that wouldn't upset us and things that would upset us that don't upset them. And the reason why that's important to grasp is because we read the Bible today and we're going through and it's like, oh, this is such a sexist, you know, <laughs> thing. this is horrible. How could they this? And, and we struggle within our conscience because our conscience has been shaped by this idea of, you know, romance and so on and so forth. So that I, I read about Jacob and Leah and Rachel. And I'm like, how could God oh, allow wow. this? Yeah. You know, but it's because I'm weighing scripture by a very modern, unique circumstance that didn't exist in the ancient world. And things were very different back then. And the women weren't, you know, they, they, the, the women weren't feeling as oppressed as they are now. And was there injustice being done to the women? Yes, a lot of times. Probably there was also now. justice being done to men. I mean, they were being put into slavery. They were being sent off to war. They were being sacrificed for some kings. You know, I mean, there, there was it was a horrible time to live. You know, period. And 
Yes. Without antibiotics. Yes. Well, yeah. Without <laughs> antibiotics. Yes. So I mean, it's it, you know, you if you because if you sat down and did a study and said you know how great was life for men back then, it wasn't that awesome for them either. And many of them, unless you were the firstborn and inheriting, you you were in trouble too. Uh, you know, the firstborn got a lion's share of the inheritance, and if you're further down, if you're like the if you're like the lastborn of the lastborn of the lastborn of the lastborn, you're you're hurting, and <laughs> life's unfair. So uh, it's not just women that have a difficult life in this kind of culture. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's, and the main reason, like I said, like I said that's important, is because we can start to struggle with our confidence in Scripture and in the love of God being presented in Scripture. Because it's loving people in a very different culture than ours. So, you know, the, you know Leah, for instance, um, here she is tricked into marrying Jacob or tricked Jacob into marrying her. Uh, we have no idea what her part was in it. But she, she's married to Jacob. She's clearly an unwanted wife. And you say, how wrong this is. And da, da, da. Well, yes, it was. Laban did do that. But then God sees Leah's bad circumstance and gives her what was more valuable than what Rachel, I mean, because she, he gives Leah the children and Rachel's ticked. I mean, here she is. She has all the romance with Jacob. She's like, I don't care about your romance. I want kids, you know, and it's just, there, there's that different sense that's there that we just don't have today. So <laughs> always and Leah struggle. ended up married or not married, buried by Jacob. Yep. Yeah. Jacob was buried with Leah, not Rachel. Yeah. And the other interesting thing of that is in the is in the dream, in the vision of the bales of hay bowing down and stuff like that, and the sun and the moon and the star. It's Leah that's the moon. It's it's Leah that's the um, the twelfth one. There. I always struggled with a guy that was in love with going to a girl and not know it was the one he actually loved, even in the dark. So that's why I've, I've always wondered about that. That's always sort of got me they, curious. They celebrated well. That's what I was thinking. They celebrated well. really have to be drunk, so I, whatever. I mean, think, think how Lot felt. So, <laughs> so yeah. All right, any other questions? How, how long does this how long more months do we have for this class? Um, we have, uh, it's not exact because the, the final lessons have to be uh, tuned up, but uh, I would say that we'll be, we'll be finishing up or be around uh, Easter. So mm-hmm. is what we'll do. And then I'll see what, if I, I might take a little bit of a break before I, I want to try to take, it might be a little bit longer breaks. I want to put together a church history one that's only like about, you know, maybe six weeks or something like that to, to do. So. I have a question. Is yeah. the revelation class ever going to be offered to both men and women? Um, if, we, if there's a strong interest in, in a revelation study, just, we can throw them together and do one. So, yeah. So, yeah, I've actually been contemplating doing a, a midweek Bible study during the day, I know not everybody can make that, but I could. it would be I fun, and we could record fun. it or something. But, um, yeah. but yeah, part part of it is just the I, with the evenings away from family, it's hard to do that. But I love the extra Bible study in the middle. So.